So here are our notes on liquids and solids, or as I like to call them, sockwids. Um, I can't take credit for that word. That was one of my AP kids that came up with it a few years ago. I thought it was funny. So first of all, here's some vocabulary that you will need to know by the end of this. Don't feel the need to write all this down at once. We will get to all of these um, in the process of these notes. <clears throat> so first of all, liquids and solids. We just finished our chapter on gases. And we talked about how, according to the kinetic molecular theory, gases have elastic collisions when they hit each other. They experience absolutely no forces of attraction or repulsion at all. That's according to kinetic molecular theory for an ideal gas. Of course, real gases do have a little bit of attraction and repulsion, but not very much. That all changes once we get to solids and liquids because solids and liquids are actually caused by these things called intermolecular forces. I just call them IMFs. Now this prefix inter, it means between separate things. So like the interstate would be the highway that connects two different states, whereas the intramolecular forces Just like the intrastate is a highway that doesn't cross state lines, um, the intramolecular forces are forces that are within a molecule, also known as bonds. Ionic bonds, covalent bonds, metallic bonds, those are all examples of intramolecular forces. Whereas an intermolecular force is going to be a force that is between adjacent molecules in a solid and a liquid. It's what makes solids and liquids possible. It's what takes, you know, this little molecule guy over here and attracts him to this little molecule guy over there and allows them to have this little connection because, you know, solids and liquids are packed close together. There's lots of forces of attraction that are holding them together. Without IMFs, these particles would just go off and be gases. Without intermolecular forces, we wouldn't have solids or liquids. So these guys are pretty darn important. A couple of things to know. If your particular substance has a high IMF, I'll tell you exactly what it is to be a high IMF in a minute, um, that causes that substance to have a higher melting point, meaning it melts at a higher temperature, so it's more likely to be a solid. Um, or if it is a liquid, it has a higher boiling point. Stronger IMFs lead towards solids, liquids, definitely not gases. And so we're going to talk about, it's, this is really three, the three IMFs, because these two are kind of the same thing. They're types of dipole forces, but because they're so different in force, I go ahead and classify them differently. So first we have hydrogen bonding. It's the strongest. I don't necessarily like that they use the word bonding here because a bond is an intramolecular force. Hydrogen bonding is actually an intermolecular force. Um, it's it's uh, an attraction between separate molecules that contain hydrogen and some other important elements that we'll talk about in a little bit um, later. I'm going to get into detail about each of these four things in just a little bit. This is just an introduction. Um, but hydrogen bonding is the strongest IMF. Ion dipole forces, which is the interaction between an ion and a dipole. I'll tell you what that means in just a second. Then you have dipole dipoles. And then the weakest of all are the London dispersion forces. And I was trying to come up with a way to remember the relative strengths of these IMFs, of these th uh, four different <clears throat> forces here. And so I came up with injuries. These are sports injuries. I guess paper cut's not really a sports injury. But these kind of help you know how they compare to each other. Hydrogen bonding would be like a broken bone. And I'm not talking some weenie little fracture that, you know, you don't even notice for a couple of days. I'm talking the bone. It's compound fracture. It's sticking out of your skin. You got blood coming out. It's a bleh. It's gross. That's hydrogen bonding. That's how strong that sucker is. Then just a tiny step down from that are your ion dipole forces. And I kind of likened this one to a torn ACL. It's almost as bad as a compound fracture. Just doesn't look as bad. And the recovery from it maybe, you know, doesn't require lots of pins and needles and whatnot. But it's probably is going to require some surgery. So these, 
They're both really bad. These two forces are both pretty strong in the world of IMFs. Um, then taking a big step down from that, you have your dipole-dipole interactions. Um, and this would be about equivalent to a sprained ankle. So sprained ankle, not nearly as bad as a tore ACL or a compound fracture, but it's still bad enough. So this, not nearly as strong, the dipole-dipole forces, not nearly as strong as these two, but strong enough in its own right. And then you have the sad little London dispersion forces. They're the weakest IMF of all. And this year it was brought up, hey, maybe instead of a paper cut, you could say that London's dispersion forces is that random bruise that you just always seem to have, but you never know where it came from. Uh, it's not really anything you notice, unless it's the only thing that you have, as far as injuries are concerned, or as far as forces are concerned. If you had a compound fracture, you wouldn't really notice the random paper cut that you've got. If you have hydrogen bonding going on, you're not really gonna notice your London dispersion forces. And again, I'll explain that a little bit more in just a second, but this is just an introduction. Um, so in order of decreasing strength, strongest to weakest, as far as IMFs are concerned, Hydrogen bonding, ion dipole, dipole dipole, London dispersion is the weakest. Now, how do these IMFs compare to our bonds? Well, if we stick to the whole injury analogy, a bond would be on the level of having your arms and legs ripped off. So this, a bond in intramolecular force, is significantly stronger than all of these guys. But in the world of IMFs, hydrogen bonding is the big guy. But anytime you're comparing, you know, a hydrogen bond to an ionic bond, the ionic bond is significantly, significantly stronger. Um, also, if you've forgotten about your types of bonds, ionic, covalent, polar covalent, nonpolar covalent, all of that, I would really suggest going back and watching the bonding video or reviewing the bonding section chapter uh, in your book um, because you are going to need to remember how to determine whether or not a bond is polar, nonpolar, because that comes into play when we start talking about whether or not something's going to have a dipole dipole interaction or if it's just going to have a London dispersion force. All right, first up, hydrogen bonding. This is a super duper strong type of dipole dipole force, but it only exists if you have a compound where you have a hydrogen bonded to a fluorine, an oxygen, or a nitrogen. So hydrogen bonding only occurs when you have hydrogen bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So like you have water, which is an oxygen bonded to two hydrogens this compound would experience hydrogen bonding. So would ammonia. And I'm not drawing the lone pairs on the central atom just because I'm being lazy. And so would hydrofluoric acid. And so would any compound that has that group on it. Oh, sorry, I meant to include that H. This little amino group on it. Um, well, this would only exist like that, but so anytime you see an OH, anytime you see an NH2, you're going to be having some hydrogen bonding go on in there. Um, and the hydrogen bonding explains why water has this ridiculously high boiling point when you compare it to other compounds of a similar structure. The compound that's most similar in structure to water is actually um, hydrogen sulfide looks almost the same as water, has the same Vesper structure, this bent structure, the sulfur has the two lone pairs, just like the oxygen does. Difference is, this is a gas, whereas this is a liquid with a very high boiling point. The reason that this is a gas is because it only experiences the dipole-dipole interaction, which I'll explain in a minute, and this has the hydrogen bonding. And remember before, I'm going to go back to where it was, right here, higher IMFs lead to higher boiling points. Hydrogen bonding is a stronger IMF than dipole-dipoles, which is why water is a liquid at room temperature and hydrogen sulfide is a gas. Um, and it also, ex um, hydrogen bonding explains why water expands when it freezes, which is just this totally mind-boggling thing. If you really think about it, water is the only substance that expands when it freezes. Everything else contracts, it's just crazy to me. Um, and water has this ridiculously high surface tension, which is why you see water droplets. Like, you know, when, when rain falls on your car, it 
beads off instead of just doing this like you know amorphous puddle like uh, alcohol would if you know you spilled alcohol on the tabletop it's going to do this weird amorphous oozing thing so will oil and things that don't have real strong IMFs whereas water is just going to hold its shape and do this little bubble thing all right moving down from hydrogen we have or hydrogen bonding we have our dipole forces you can have the ion dipole force which exists between ions and a polar molecule and this is what enables some salts to dissolve in water so like you have sodium chloride and it will dissolve in water because what happens is, you know, the sodium has a plus one charge, chlorine has a negative one charge. Well, water is polar, and the oxygen being more electronegative makes this end just kind of sort of negative, and this end just kind of sort of positive. And what ends up happening is the hydrogen is attracted to the chlorine and actually pulls it away from the sodium, whereas, you know, another water molecule can come up and it'll point the negative oxygen and it'll do this little dipole ion force right here and pull the sodium away and the substance will actually dissolve. Um, and then you can have dipole-dipole forces which would exist between separate polar molecules and you know water is an extreme form of the dipole-dipole force, the hydrogen bonding, where it's just the negative end of one molecule is attracted to the positive end of another molecule. So if we did that hydrogen sulfide like we were talking about before, well, this sulfur is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so this end's going to be slightly negative. This end's going to be slightly positive. So this end will be attracted to the hydrogen end of another hydrogen sulfide, whereas this over here will be attracted to the sulfur end of another hydrogen sulfide. And so you'd have some nice little dipole going on here. Now, you might be wondering, why am I drawing dotted lines as opposed to solid lines? Well, I use solid lines to represent my intramolecular force and dotted lines to represent my intermolecular forces. So that's just a little hint there. Then the weakest forces of them all are your London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces can only be measurably experienced, I mean they're experienced by everything. Every single atom and molecule will have London dispersion forces, but you can only observe them in nonpolar molecules. And if you remember the London dispersion forces is what I was calling a paper cut. You only notice a paper cut if that's the only injury that you have. You only notice London dispersion forces if that's the only intermolecular force that you have. And so in polar molecules, in ions, in compounds that have hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, you have all these other IMFs that are kind of overshadowing the London dispersion forces. But nonpolar molecules, they don't have any of that stuff. They don't have hydrogen bonding or dipole interactions. They only have London dispersion forces. And the way that London dispersion forces work is they're caused by an induced dipole. So what the heck does that mean? Well, let's say you have an atom. Here's our little nucleus. And you have lots of electrons, you know, zipping around in the electron cloud. This is obviously not a perfect drawing, but it's just giving you the idea that you've just got a bunch of electrons zipping around here. And they're all moving around as long as they stay in whatever energy level they're supposed to be in. They're great. <clears throat> but they're moving around independent of each other. It could at one point just so happen that when all these electrons are zipping around that they all for a split second end up over on this side of the atom. Well, what that causes is a temporary dipole. So let's say all the electrons just for a split second have gone over to this side. Well, that would cause this side of the atom to be just a little bit positive and this side of the atom to be just a little bit negative. There's a dipole. Well, this atom is right up against another atom. And what that does, this negativeness that has just shown up over here, causes the electrons on this atom to go, oh, I don't like this negative thing, you know, the whole likes repel. So the electrons all get away from the negative, which then causes a temporary dipole on this atom. And then it goes on and on and on, nice little domino effect. And so it's this temporary dipole that is the cause 
of a London dispersion force. This temporary negativeness here and positiveness here causes these two particles to be attracted to each other and enables them to be in the liquid or solid states. Now, who does this work better with? Well, the more electrons you have, the more likely you are to get them off balance. And so atoms that have more electrons, more easily polarized, made into a temporary dipole, and so their London dispersion forces would be stronger. Point in question of this, if you look at the 17th group on the periodic table, you have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And if you remember, these four guys are all part of the Brinkelhoff twins, so that whenever they're in nature by themselves in their pure state, you actually have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine in this diatomic state. And so these are all nonpolar molecules because anytime you have an atom bonded to another atom, this makes a nonpolar bond because each of these guys is going to have the same electronegativity. To determine the polarity of a bond, you just subtract electronegativities. So Electronegativity of difference of zero means that you have a nonpolar bond. And if you look on just about any periodic table, you'll see that at room temperature, fluorine and chlorine are both gases, bromine's a liquid, and iodine is a solid. These guys are gases because they don't have enough electrons to have a strong enough London dispersion force to make these atoms be attracted to each other and go into the liquid or solid state. So they're stuck being gases. Well, finally, once you reach bromine and it's 35 electrons per atom, that is now enough electrons to provide enough attraction from those London dispersion forces that we now have a liquid. And then iodine's 53 electrons. That's definitely enough and is actually so much so that this, the attractive forces are strong enough that iodine at room temperature is a solid. So the more electrons you have, the stronger the LDFs, London dispersion forces LDFs, and the more likely you are to have a liquid or a solid. The weaker IMFs are associated with gases, stronger IMFs are associated with liquids and solids. All right, so these are just a couple of liquid properties. Uh, this is mostly just definitions. Viscosity is, a, is, I call it the goopiness factor. The more goopy a liquid is, the more viscosity it has. So like a molasses and motor oil and uh, like shampoo and things like that, they have a very high viscosity, whereas water and rubbing alcohol, um, things like that have a very low viscosity. Then you have surface tension. Um, <clears throat> which is what causes water droplets. Um, then cohesive forces kind of go along with surface tension. And then adhesive forces would be the ability of something to bond to something else, like water to glass tubing. Um, this is what causes the meniscus in a graduated cylinder, in a glass graduated cylinder. Uh, it actually, the water's trying to climb up the sides of that glass cylinder, but it only works with um, glass when it comes to water because water is attracted to glass. It's not attracted to plastic. Um, then, you know what, I think I'm going to pause this. We'll do vapor pressure on the next video because I think this guy's long enough.